much again for uh, for attending this this workshop, and thank you, me and Jeff, for, for being here as well. Uh, this session is devoted to the Supreme Court, but we're going to take a riff, a little riff on that concept of the Supreme Court to uh, anticipate what other Supreme Courts might want to do with information if it were freely available. And uh, but for uh, my commentary and for Lee's and for a portion of Jeff's, uh, we'll stay true to the mission of talking about the Supreme Court and access uh, to its uh, primary materials. Uh, so the OEA project, uh, for those of you who don't know about it, has been around for about 15 years or so in various incarnations. Uh, and right now, um, it uh, dishes out an enormous amount, a staggering amount of material to uh, a fairly wide audience, largely in the United States and Canada, although uh, still some non-trivial traffic around the world. Uh, most recently, we had about uh, 850,000 user sessions in the month of uh, April with about 450,000 unique visitors. Um, accessing 3.6 million page views of content with about seven minutes per session on the site, and downloading a little more than 1.7 terabytes of data, largely in the form of oral arguments. Uh, we collect the oral arguments when they're available, when they're made available by the court. A rather contentious issue for me, although uh, it hasn't managed to change the court's policy, and I'll get back to that in a minute or two. And we have retrieved and digitized all of the audio held at the National Archives uh, from 1955 to the present. And uh, piece, term by term, we are making the content of, uh, of that digitization effort available through the OEA project. In fact, uh, I think next week we'll probably post audio from 1967, that was probably a good year, 190 hours of audio compared to the 19, to the 2008 term, I think we had about 80 hours of audio, including oral pronouncements and opinions. So uh, the court is spending far less time at oral argument uh, deciding fewer cases, uh, but this uh, historical material seems to have some attraction to a wide, uh, a wide array of users. Um, we, uh, we are pushing slowly but surely into new environments to make access uh, convenient. Uh, and one of our little projects was the release of Pocket Justice, an iPhone application. And thanks to the enormous generosity of Justia, Tim Stanley, we, this Pocket Justice uh, is available as a free app for iPhone users, and it seems to be uh, pretty attractive. Uh, it has a, uh, the, the, the engineering that went into it uh, is clever. Uh, I guess I could summarize uh, its functionality as flip, tap, listen. That's all you have to do. It's sort of today's version of rip, mix, burn. Uh, the next step, of course, is to, for us to give you an iPhone, uh, an iPad application, which will, uh, with uh, greater real estate, allow us to integrate not just the audio um, and the abstracts and the voting data, but uh, perhaps even your opinions as well. Uh, and one of the features we hope we can implement is audio annotation of the audio. So when you're listening to a chunk of audio, tap on a section that you think is important, then in the transcript, uh, then you can also annotate that with a voice commentary. Uh, so uh, finding new ways to use this information is really exciting. When we're done, and uh, that is when I, I, I reach my milestone of, of uh, transcribing the audio, annotating, um, identifying all the speakers, and synchronizing the transcripts to the audio at the sentence level, we'll have a, a database of about 110 million words um, over 55 years uh, that will 
outdistance any uh, similar database of English, of spoken English uh, that uh, I know of, actually. The closest one is in size, about 50 million words, so I think we've uh, really gone over the top, but it's just, uh, it's the last mile for us, or basically the last 2,000 hours of audio, that's a great challenge. Uh, the earliest audio has some um, challenging issues to it, and we have to uh, put in some exceptional engineering effort to make, uh, to, to make those materials audible and transcribable and then uh, use our speaker identification models to say, do I figure out who actually whispered that comment because he failed to turn off his microphone. So that's, uh, that's our challenge. Um, the, the big challenge going forward is getting the court to release these materials in a more timely way. Court for the last 50 years has, 55 years, has released the audio at the end, the official end of the current term, which is the first Monday in October. So even though an argument took place on October 9th of 2009, you will not hear it until sometime in October 2010. And just, it seems to me utterly nonsensical not to release these materials. And I think uh, we collectively have to find ways to challenge John Roberts uh, to justify why there can be no change in the existing policy, given the demand for the content and the, uh, uh, that's easy to demonstrate, and to convince the Supreme Court that what it did 55 years ago can now be altered ever so slightly, perhaps releasing the audio in the end of June, perhaps releasing the audio at the end of every month perhaps releasing the audio at the end of every week. God forbid, release the audio same day. Uh, but these are easy steps to accomplish. Uh, and uh, the challenge, of course, is to get the court to recognize that, um, that the American people deserve access to, uh, to that information. It's great irony, isn't it, that here we are seeking to open up our legal institutions for a public view and uh, just in the last couple of weeks, the Supreme Court decided to permanently close entrance to the Supreme Court through its new doors. So access to justice, in a way, is still foreclosed through the normal channels. But uh, there are some clever people in this room who can nevertheless find ways to make access to these legal materials uh, engaging and valuable to us all. That's a nice segue to my colleague, Lee Epstein, uh, who is a bona fide political scientist and uh, a member, a distinguished member of the uh, faculty at Northwestern Law School. And she, for many years, has worked on a project called the Supreme Court Database. I'm going to ask, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Lee to uh, describe the Supreme Court Database, its origins, and its value for, uh, for open access to legal information. And while she's doing that, I'm hoping that Jeff can bring up uh, law.gov as a, I mean, uh, uh, the Supreme Court database website so that you can actually see it and understand how it operates. So stand around. <coughs> Just very briefly, uh, the Supreme Court database provides information, uh, two, 200 plus pieces of information on every case that's been argued before the Supreme Court since 1953. And the information ranges from basic things, the name of the case, the docket number, all the citations, um, date of argument, date of decision, all the way through um, what, what law was at issue, what were the basic issues in the case, how did the justices vote, who wrote what opinions, that sort of information on every single case uh, since the 1953 term. Uh, we just got a grant from the National Science Foundation to take the database back to the first uh, published Supreme Court opinion in, 19, in 1792. So that's what we'll be working on for the next three years, is to backdate the database. The database is updated every at the end of every term. So at the end of June, 
uh, will have covered the 2009 term. I can give you just a little bit of history about it. Uh, the database <coughs> was actually started by a fellow named Harold Spade in the mid-1980s. Harold is a very uh, prominent political scientist, but he's also a lawyer. And he got an initial grant from the National Science Foundation to create the database. Um, it, it quickly became the dominant tool for information on the Supreme Court in the political science community. But frankly, it wasn't used uh, very much by uh, lawyers, journalists, law professors, law librarians, and so on, because the only way you could access it was through uh, statistical software like SPSS and Stata. And so you needed sort of specialized knowledge of that software to use. And you know, throughout the years, what would happen would be people like myself and Harold and others would get phone calls from law professors and lawyers. They wanted basic information, journalists in particular too, wanted basic information about the Supreme Court. How many cases did the court uh, over, override its own decisions? How many laws of Congress did the court overturn, and so on, each term. And they would call us to get the information. So what we did a couple of years back is we went to the National Science Foundation. We said, look, we, the first thing we want to do before we backdate the database is, is modernize the whole thing and create versions of the database and an infrastructure so that anybody could access them high school students could access it. And what you're seeing up here is the result of that uh, initial grant from the National Science Foundation. Let me see, you'll see here uh, four panels. If you click on the data panel, yeah, the data, uh, and just click down here on case center. Uh, yeah, click there, right and then click on anything to show it how, yeah, right. Okay, so you can, the database now can be downloaded in lots and lots of uh, different forms. Pretty accessible from, you know, from the statistical software, Stata and so on, to Excel files. And if you go back up to the top, if you click on documentation, You'll, you'll be able to get the meaning of all of the variables in the data set here. So just click on respondent, for example. And each respondent or uh, appellee in the suit gets a code in the database. You can see there's lots and lots of different types of respondents. All of this has been coded in the database. And the other documentation on the right side, that those are all the variables in the database, and you can play with it, look, and get information about what's actually in there. Now, suppose you are utterly unfamiliar with these data packages. Is it possible to do some basic analysis from the website itself? Yes. Uh, if you go back to the home page of the, the data set, and go up to, go to analysis. Now this is a actually very cool feature of the data set. So you can do analyses of the data without actually opening any data set. Uh, go down a little. Uh, give me some data you want. How about Roberts Court? Let's look at the Roberts Court. So if you pull down, include all courtiers, pull that down. Let's just do all Roberts Court cases. I want to know how many cases uh, there was a constitutional challenge. Can okay. Uh, yeah, so let's pick orally argued cases. It says decision type up there. So, so click judgment of the court. Uh, click opinion of the court orally argued. And then click procurium orally argued. And then just go down. I think there should be a box on constitutional. Yeah, so constitution. Just click constitution. Okay. And then. But if I change my mind and say I want to know uh, what cases involve the federal statute, I'd just be able to click. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and then right. if you click sub-issues, just to click sub-issues, you can pick whatever 
part of the Constitution you want. We've clicked all of them, okay. but you can click, unclick, whatever. And then if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, we won't do anything else. You just say analyze. Just click analyze. Okay. Uh, this will just give you the case frequency for the Roberts Court. So 2005 term, two constitutional issues. I don't think we did the amendments. I think we just did the just body right. of correct. the Constitution. And if you go down, it'll tell you whether the decision was decided in a liberal direction and conservative direction. And for those meetings, you'll have to look at the, the documentation. Um, and then if you go back up, so that's just going to give you an overview. But you can click things like, um, uh, where are we? Do, uh, do case details. Right over down here. That will give you all of the constitutional cases, a list of them. And if you click on the case, view case detail, you can pick any case. It'll give you the case, where it came from, all kinds of basic information. And you can actually even get to the case, do public resource up here. Okay. Hit, uh, right on the case under case name, it says public resource. And is that, okay, we don't have that case. Uh, you know, do final. It'll take you to the case. Oops. No. Yeah. There's there's some issues with getting to the case. Uh, there's. That's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're having some issues with the early, the later, the latest cases. But if you go all the way back to '53, you should be able to get through the public resource, which is a stripped down version of the case, and uh, and fine law. But. You can analyze cases in all different ways from the, from the resource without actually having to use the database. And now uh, a lot of our law students, of course, are using anal this analysis page. You know, it doesn't require any skills at all to use it. Uh, also, journalists, of course, are using it as well. If you see uh, in, in newspapers and magazines, if it says US Supreme Court database, that's what they've used to get there. And my guess is at this point, pretty much any quantitative study of the Supreme Court is now relying on this site and these databases. Last thing I'll say is the data here are, are quite reliable. Um, we continually draw 10% samples of the data to check and, and make sure everything is uh, as it should be. And we also, of course, rely on users. And I would say once a week, somebody points out, you know, there's a mistake here, there's an error here that, that we look at. We're very responsive to the user community. I usually state those very politely to Harold Spaeth because mm -hmm. uh, I know how much energy he's put into this. But he's pretty generous when, when it's a mistake, he'll acknowledge mm -hmm. it and, and it'll change. So we trip over these usually because we have so many thousands of people looking at our data which relies in large measure for this period from the uh, Supreme Court database. And uh, that's really a nice way to integrate the uh, larger user, com user community into, perf into perfecting this rich metadata resource. Uh, what about the plans? Uh, could you talk a bit about your plans to um, build this back to 1791? Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've We've started. We've already finished the Marshall Court, so we're working backwards, actually. Um, there's been a couple of really cool features of backdating the database. Um, one is we had we have a uh, what would you call Troy? A computer science guy? I don't know. A database infrastructure guy. Uh, we've hired somebody who works full time on this, and he created an enormously useful and effective database management system. So we have four schools working on backdating the database, and I would say probably, at this point, 30 to 40 students. They can work anywhere. They can enter the data from anywhere. And it's, uh, it's just an amazingly cool back-end system with lots of safety checks in it to enter the data. Something the National Science Foundation was very interested in doing was creating a template for database entry, and that's what we've done. Uh, of course, there's been tremendous challenges with taking this database back to 1791. Um, courts, everything from, you know, we, we include in the database 
you know, from where did the case come? What was the case source? What was the origin of the case? Of course, if you know your legal history, there were scores and scores of courts back in the 1790s and 1800s that don't exist today. And so we had to do an enormous amount of state work just to create what we call legacy courts, legacy issues, lots of legal issues that the court took back then that are really off the docket now. So we, we put in a lot of work to uh, be able to, to backdate this thing, we think, and we will release it. So by the end of the summer, we're hoping to release the Marshall and the Tawny courts. We will release them as we finish them. We hope in uh, three to four years to be completely backdated, and of course, we continue to update every year. Well, it's uh, interesting that, uh, that my little uh, cadre right now is focused on GIS data for the recent cases. So we thought we'd have uh, longitudinal, lati uh, longitudinal latitude data for every case, and it would be uh, great if, if we could somehow integrate that into this larger project. Do you have any, any uh, sense whether uh, outsiders like me and others could be able to contribute in some community effort to um, enlarge and enrich the Supreme Court database? We do on the site, I think we now have things like uh, data repositories and uh, code, this would be useful for statistical analysis, code repositories, so where people can drop off uh, additional data that could be added, or they could uh, put their computer code for manipulating the data that already exists. I'll give you one example I think is already in the repository. Uh, we've developed a measure of case importance, you know, how salient or how important is a particular case that lots of social scientists use. We have put the data set in the repository so you can add it, merge it very quickly into the existing databases. And that's what we hope. Now, this is a, it's a pretty comprehensive data set, but people have very wide-ranging interests when it comes to the Supreme Court. We can't tis anticipate every single one of them. So what lots of folks do, especially in the social sciences, they create a data, they create new variables, new columns of data that they simply merge onto this existing data set, and we hope that the site will become a repository for those. You know, one of the, one of the issues that I think has helped maintain National Science Foundation funding of this project is we are very, very careful about the reliability of the data. Uh, we, want, we, we want the data to be reliable, and so um, there's some, you know, we have some hesitation about just adding variables that people give us to the existing data set with unknown reliability. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're going to keep them in the repository. Take a chance. Add them if you want. Great. We have a question or comment. Uh, gentleman in the back first. Uh, when you're doing analysis of Supreme Court uh, decisions, whether qualitative or quantitative, it's sometimes nice to have access to the papers of the justices. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I realize that those papers with respect to particular cases are available primarily only uh, for justices who have died, right? Yeah. Otherwise, these papers are not released. So my broad question is, is there access, uh, is it, is, are these papers digitized anywhere, and are they available on either of the two sites we've been talking about thus far this morning? Uh, yeah, let me let me answer. So, um, you can repeat the question. The question oh, the question concerns um, the papers of the justices, and so uh, some justices have led, left very extensive collections of their papers. For example, Justice Blackman. Others have left no papers at all. Most of the papers of the justices are located in the Library of Congress. There are exceptions. Lewis Powell left his papers at Washington and Lee Law School. The justices leave their papers on their own terms. Uh, so I, some justices, their papers will not be open until everyone with whom they've served has died. So I think that's Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, Thurgood Marshall, uh, other justices, as soon as they leave the court, the paper's open. It's, it's their choice. Uh, there's been, you know, talk that that shouldn't be, that these are, are public government papers, they should simply be released. 
uh, I think Hugo Black burned his, Correct. right? You know, so so this is right. So um, the Library of Congress, and, and by the way, Brennan made his papers available only with consent of his family. So uh, if you want to use Brennan's papers, you have to get consent of the family. For scholars and librarians and so on, that I've never heard of a turn down, but you still have to go through that gatekeeping. Um, for the most part, these papers have not been uh, digitized. They, some of them, some of the information on them has been quantified. For example, uh, how many drafts did a majority opinion go through? We quantified some of that information. I think the, there's a couple of digital, digi, just a few digital archives. We have one on a different website. If you go to my website, um, just Google me, I've seen. And just go to introduction, hit Blackman archive. Uh, scroll down and go to the archive. Click here. Yeah. So what we've got is uh, go, you can go down and just do 1986 term. Uh, okay. And just click on anything over here. We've got the docket sheets of the justices where they record their votes. Just click on anyone. <clears throat> just come up. Yeah. Uh, we've got the docket sheets of the justices up there, and we also have uh, we have PDF files of the uh, cert pool memos. Those are the memos written by the law clerks to suggest whether the court should grant or deny cert. So we have those for the 1986 through 1994 terms. This was an enormous data collection project. Again, the National Science Foundation supported it, but we had to send teams of students into the Library of Congress to photograph these documents, and then uh, we created PDF files from the documents. Then this archive, you can search the archive. Normally people, yeah, there's the cert pool memos. Normally people would search it on docket numbers, and we get you know, and not as many hits as Jerry gets on Oye, but we get a fair number of users on a daily basis. Lots of law firms like to look at these cert pool memos because it gives them some insight into how to write a cert petition for the Supreme Court. So that, that we've done, but you can see the magnitude. This is millions of pages of documents um, and the magnitude of the project, it's, it's difficult. And I don't, you know, I think the Library of Congress likes that we've done this. But they certainly don't have the funds to, to do this. Sure. There's another question. I'm wondering about the cross tab reports. Is that similar to what you can do at the census site where you put in several variables and then statistical stuff gets into the next table with the cross? Yes, that's exactly what it is. It, the the cross tabs part of the analysis site. You can do some basic tables. A cross tab is your cross tabulating two variables. So like the term of the court and the number of criminal cases, something like that. Uh, we don't have the facility to do fancier analyses, like regression analyses, we're working on it. We're trying to do it so that there are safety valves in there, that you can't mess it up too much. It's pretty easy to mess up a statistical analysis and get the wrong results. So we're trying to put some safety valves in. But right now you can do some basic stuff using the analysis feature. John. A small point, when you ask a question, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you give your name and your affiliation just real quick because not everybody in the room knows everybody. Um, but I did have a question. Okay. Um, Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I was just realizing. John Mayer, Kelly. Um, this is incredibly valuable. And, and the Supreme Court, of course, is, is very unique, but there's Lots of other courts for which this process might be gone through. Have you have you documented the making of the Supreme Court database or thought about uh, that sort of meta document that says, here's what we learned in the process of doing this? Yes, I believe that the people who have worked on the back end have documented all of this stuff and um, it's, are, are sharing it 
through publications and other means with people who develop these kinds of databases. Um, it, it, it is a good story. I mean, the whole thing tracing back to the 1980s and the person that we would really need to get to, to do the front end stuff is Howard State. And he, to really do a, an oral history with him and then write, you know, written history of, of this would be, somebody should do it. Well, I don't somebody know, I don't know recording it as well. Yeah. Um, uh, let me ask you another question about that database. Um, uh, lots of scholars are relying on the Quinn Martin Index. Uh, that's Kevin Quinn and Andrew Martin. Andrew is a collaborator of yours with the Supreme Court database. Uh, and uh, these ideological scores are really robust, but they rely on um, data from the Supreme Court database built on non-unanimous decisions. But in the period, in the earlier period that you're now investigating and working on, there are very few split decisions. Is there some way to construct a, a, a similarly robust ideological index for this earlier period in the court's history? Yeah, I mean, this is an issue. So one of the things I think uh, scientists and increasingly law professors and journalists are interested in are the, is the ideal, ideology of the justices, of the decisions, you know, how conservative is Clarence Thomas, sort of thing. Um, and we've relied, as Jerry says, on these, on these uh, Martin Quinn estimates of ideology, and it's a sort of complicated algorithm, but they apply the algorithm, as Jerry says, to cases with dissent. Uh, if you go back in the court's history, really before 1930s, very minimal levels of dissent. So how do you get the ideology of the court? One way to do it is through looking at the conference votes as opposed to the final votes. So we looked at the conference votes, the docket sheets, private docket sheets of Chief Justice Waite, not a very memorable Chief Justice except for the fact that he left his docket books, 10 years worth. And it turns out that in private conference, dissenting then was as high as it is now. They just never made the dissents public. So assuming we know we have them for tab, assuming we can get the private docket books, that would be a way to do it. Um, we also might want to look at separate writings like occurrences. But it's, it's an issue because what happens is there's so few dissents if you try to assess the ideology of the justices or the cases, that you're going to have huge error terms. Because there's a, so you're basing your estimates on such a small number of cases. Well, it's great that uh, that's a great discovery and uh, a nice, uh, hopeful vision that you'll be able to, to advance that, that piece of scholarship. Well, um, I'm, are there any other questions for Lee? Right. Then uh, it's my I hope point. you use it. <laughs> it's great. Uh, I want to turn the, the discussion over to my colleague and friend Jeff Parsons. Uh, Jeff uh, wrote to me several years ago out of the blue and offered uh, uh, to assist me with uh, further development of the Odia project. And if you have followed my work over several years and you've noticed the improvements, uh, I'll give 95 percent of the credit to Jeff uh, because it was his inspiration and his hard work that led to uh, the improvements that we have now and I'm sure for the plans we have for the future. Uh, Jeff has, uh, in his remarks, uh, has uh, talk, he's going to riff, I guess I'll call it that, it's a riff on the Supreme Court. Uh, one of one thought that uh, Jeff had and I endorsed um, a few years ago was to figure out how we could spread the idea of public access to state Supreme Courts and to intermediate federal appellate courts. Um, our reason for doing this is that in my judgment, and I'm prepared to make the argument, that uh, courts themselves are never going to view the public as a principal client. Client, the client base for any court would typically include the attorneys who argue there, other judges, court personnel, um, 
and, and those who are intimately connected with the day-to-day -day operation of that particular institution. But we, the public, I think, are at some distance. So it's going to take the effort of some devoted outsider to take that information and recreate it in a form that would be useful to a larger uh, audience. It may be a professional audience, but it could be a non-professional audience. So um, Jeff uh, decided to engage the, Supreme, uh, the Washington State Supreme Court uh, with this idea of a, I guess we call it a, a, a derivative OEA project. Uh, with, and I'll let him talk about what he's done there. And then I hope he'll share his current work on the Supreme Court on a, uh, one or two other projects related to the U.S. Supreme Court subject. So floor is yours. Right. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I was very fortunate to uh, look up with Jerry and uh, spent the last four or five years working with him on the OE project. Um, I guess, in keeping with the theme of the, of the conference here, um, I wanted to mention a few things that, you know, frustrations that we've had over time uh, with dealing with the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, a couple examples would be um, briefs. Unfortunately, uh, a few years ago, the court um, agreed to start making briefs available on their own website, but for some reason, they never actually did that. There's always been some sort of back channel of the U.S. Supreme Court to the ADA and ABA that posts the briefs. Um, and uh, so that's, that's been one frustration. Um, and making sure that the briefs are complete for every case uh, we've discovered that oftentimes uh, ABA doesn't have everything uh, associated with the case. And we try to, uh, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of getting as many briefs as possible linked to the OEA case pages, but that's one of the goals of the OEA project is, is to make those available uh, on each of the case pages. Another frustration was uh, docket sheets. For some reason, it was never really explained. The, a few years ago, the court purged um, at least uh, five or six years worth of docket sheets off their website. And uh, you know, we were able to get copies of them from the Internet Archive using the Wayback Machine. Um, and I think maybe the court has restored them now that they've updated their website. So that's, that's, that's good, but uh, I think it, it highlights a fundamental problem, which is that we don't have um, there's no real assurance that the government seems to, you know, we want, we like to see commitment when um, this data is out there, that it be preserved. And unfortunately, when there, when there isn't that commitment, the data just mysteriously disappears sometimes. So anyway, after uh, working for several years on the OEA project, um, and since I live in the state of Washington, and by the way, I should mention that I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an academic, I'm just a software engineer. Um, who just happens to take an interest in, in the courts. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was simultaneously impressed and dismayed with uh, this, our state court resources. So we, have, we have a uh, state court website where they'll publish their slip opinions and, and they're there for 90 days. Uh, and they publish a calendar and it, it, there, there's, there's also these other resources. We have another organization called TBW, which is funded with a combination of public and private money. And the last 15 years, they've been doing a, a fantastic job of recording audio and video of all the legislative sessions and uh, Supreme Court, state Supreme Court arguments. Uh, and then, then there's another similar website where you can get past it after the slip, slip opinions disappeared after 90 days, you go to a third website. It's called the Municipal Research and Services Council site. And you can get past opinions there. So we have there's a wealth of resources, but unfortunately, they're all spread out. There's no uh, connection between them. And it can be a challenge to get all the information 
about a particular case if you're looking for something. So I thought, well, let's let's see if we can uh, replicate something like the way you project for the state of Washington. So uh, and that's where the, the uh, since our courthouse is called the Temple of Justice, that's what I decided to call the project. After uh, about a year's worth of looking around for a sponsor, I think we we found uh, we found a good uh, home for the project at Washington State University. Uh, uh, there's a political scientist there, Cornell Clayton, who's uh, director of the Foley Institute, and uh, he's been great in terms of getting the uh, people uh, to help populate the uh, the web this new website that with uh, abstracts for landmark cases. Which that was our initial focus was Washington State landmark cases, and. And then for the last few years, we're trying to get abstracts in place for all of the, uh, the recent cases. And maybe I should actually start by some of these slides. OK, so I, I kind of touched on this. Um, the, uh, so some of the motiv motivations is just unification. You know, uh, it was, uh, I mean, it's great that there's Google, and Google can usually find what you're looking for. But um, I think it, the OEA approach is, is much preferred, where all the information about a case is centralized. You want to find the briefs, you want to find the opinions, you want to find the votes, um, you want to find just a basic description of the case. And it's great to just have one place to go. Uh, so another frustration was the, just the lack of preservation, the fact that slip opinions disappeared. Um, and, and I understand why. I mean, we've had conversations with uh, the court administrator uh, about this. And obviously, the, you know, once an opinion is published, that's the official opinion. They don't want people referring to the civil opinions. Um, but you know, the, the reality is that the world, the internet world, links to these things. And it would be great if we had some sort of a standard where once you link to an opinion, the link lives forever. You know, the, the sub opinion may ultimately re be replaced by a published opinion, but the link should should uh, shouldn't go dead. Uh, we also have uh, there's, there's an interesting collection of uh, audio materials housed at the state archives. Uh, unfortunately, they're uh, they're not cataloged in any, in any reasonable way. It's about another 15 years. I think it goes back to the early 80s. Uh, so from the early 80s and around 95, they have a bunch of cassette tapes at the archives. Uh, and it's, it's kind of hit and miss because they didn't record every case. They would reuse cassettes often. So it was basically whatever the last case was we're not getting to would, be, uh, would be stored. And yeah, the, the other other frustration um, is basically that the uh, the state uh, there is no clear commitment to the state preserving this information. So I guess it's really incumbent on other groups um, to take up that challenge, and the challenge only grows because, unfortunately, uh, they're just producing new opinions every year. They're not uh, they never go away. And then a third motivation was just improving the public awareness of the court uh, and making it more accessible, more understandable. Because you know, uh, the average person trying to parse uh, a case synopsis that's posted on the state court website, it, it's really challenging. It's usually just one sentence. And it will refer to you know, probably some section of the revised code of Washington and people don't often know. Uh, to find that either, so it'll be great to solve some of these problems. And then we'll provide some historical information. Um, again, the court is really just focused on the present. So try to find the biography of a justice who served 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, that's all gone. So we're trying to resurrect that that past. Then it'll be some sections on the site to explain the history and operation of the court and, uh, and address a lot of common questions. Our court likes to travel every, uh, uh, they have three terms a year and at least once every term. 
they uh, will travel to another, uh, you know, generally university or community college, and they'll actually hear cases at that venue, and then they'll also uh, take questions from the audience. And so there's a lot of recurring questions that come up. You know, how does the operation of the state court compare to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court? So there'll be a thing like that that we can address. So this is just some pictures of some, some of the challenges. The, uh, the That red volume that you see is uh, something they used to maintain up until the early 80s. So they have these docket volumes. I have some screenshots of the pages in there. And they actually meticulously record all the justices who were in attendance for a given case and uh, who the attorneys that actually argued the cases were, how long they argued. And unfortunately, this is all data that um, they either don't keep anymore, or if they do, it's buried in their case management system. And, there's, and we've asked if there's any way we could get that data from them, and uh, that, that apparently isn't, isn't possible, at least with the current system they're using. Uh, one of the challenges in producing a site like the Temple of Justice website um, is pulling together all that information I talked about that's scattered across these different sites. So I've built multiple scripts that go and periodically get that information from those sites. Some of it is automated. Um, for example, as new briefs appear on the state court website, they automatically appear on the Temple of Justice site. Uh, and when new opinions appear, I'm actually able to parse the opinion and, and, and display a vote. Uh, how, many people, how many justices were in the majority, how many dissented. But it still needs some human intervention. There's, and that's where um, the Polling Institute at Washington State can come in and, and provide the uh, plain English description of the, of the, uh, the case and how it was resolved. And hopefully we'll be able to do a better uh, better job of rendering the opinions, particularly past opinions, because unfortunately, in the process of going from slip opinion to published opinion to an electronic opinion that appears on, the, on another website, uh, it gets mangled in the process. Oftentimes, you bring up an opinion that's littered with question marks and strange characters because they obviously haven't, uh, they obviously didn't start with the right character set. <coughs> Another thing uh, we've been looking at is using Google Scholar to uh, as as a way of displaying the past opinions. Since they provide state court opinions going back to 1950, currently, and hopefully they'll eventually go all the way back. Uh, but I have the same concern about Google Scholar that I have about <coughs> the uh, state and federal governments in general, and that's their commitment to preserving this data. I'm not sure that Google has actually stated. Um, for example, if you have a link to one of their opinions, mm -hmm. will that link persist in perpetuity? Or will it go dead like some of the other links seem to do after a few years? And, and what is their commitment to this data? I know they pay a fair amount of money to get all of this data. Um, will there be some point where it doesn't make good business sense for Google to continue posting this data? And if so, um, what's the plan for making sure that that remains available to the public? And then uh, just just finding the, the the links to the opinions can be a challenge uh, because there isn't really a standard for the, the link format. If you actually find it in Google Scholar, you, you'll probably notice that the, the URL has this very long case ID, uh, which doesn't really correlate to uh, uh, a U.S. report citation, for example. So getting those getting those links is kind of a challenge. You can't just fire off the scripts to get them all because Google will block you because they say, oh, you must be scraping our site, so we're not going to let you, you do that. And then another issue would be just promoting greater transparency. Um, like I said, there's all this metadata that's basically trapped inside the case management system. I think it would be great I mean, there's at least for object data as opposed to subject data, it would be great if the if all the data that was objective could be serviced so that the Supreme Court Data Grace Project, for example, wouldn't have to go in, write scripts or whatever to actually extract that data from, uh, from other sources, but it was just provided in some XML that the court published along with uh, the docket or the opinion. I think that would be preferable. And a final issue was uh, 
just the the uh, the differences that we run into, at least in the state of Washington, when dealing with administrators versus the actual justices. Um, typically, the, the default answer for anything you ask from an administrator is no. Uh, whereas the chief justice, and we have we've talked to uh, uh, last year's chief justice and our new chief justice this year, and they've both been been very supportive of the project. Uh, they wanted us to be. They wanted to be very clear and have a, a clear disclaimer on our site that there's no that the Supreme Court is not endorsing our site. Um, that it's a completely separate venture, and we've done that. Uh, and once that's been done, they've been very very interested in, in this project. And in fact, uh, Cornell Clayton and I met with all nine justices a few months ago to give a little overview of the OEA project and the Temple of Justice project that we hope to have finished by late summer. And they were very, uh, very interested and, and supportive of it. So that's good news. So the Temple of Justice site is live now. It still says beta on the banner. Uh, we still have a lot of cases to abstract, and uh, we've also done. A, we also did a bunch of photography last month at the court, and we're in the process of putting together a little virtual tour so you can see what it's like to walk through the, the court and visit the justices' chambers, which most people don't. I, I should point out too that the, the site was put together with uh, basic off-the-shelf open source software. We didn't, we didn't pay any money for it. It's just WordPress with uh, a few basic plugins to take advantage of built-in metadata support for WordPress now. And then uh, some custom custom theme work to, to actually handle the, the way we want the case pages to actually appear. I suppose I could probably bring up a web browser real quick. Things that 
that the state court should be doing. And I think this applies to the OEA project and the Supreme Court. If the OEA project has such a wonderful resource, do we need the Supreme Court to do anything? <clears throat> we, need to, we need them to at least, like you said, serve us more metadata, I guess. Just provide us with fees so that whenever opinion is released or there's a change to the docket, there's some sort of like like an RSS feed that, yeah, I think those are typically associated with articles, right? I'm thinking, you know, something like an RSS feed, but it, it just surfaces um, new XML with all the metadata for that case. Um, there was, so if there's just more uh, information like that available, that, that would be Right. In fact, one of the comments from the Supreme Court justices was that, why don't you guys work on our website? Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, sent, I sensed some frustration with the, the limitations of their own site. They're aware of it. Um, but apparently they don't have the money or the manpower to really do much. Their site really hasn't changed much for the last probably almost 10 years, I'd say. Oh, Jeff, oh, there's a question. State your, state your name, please. Ron Scott from Chicago. Okay. So, so Carl's question sort of makes me wonder why you shouldn't be working on the Washington State Supreme Court's website, because I suspect that you're much more fragile than they are in terms of these durability issues and who's going to be there in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Um, so it, isn't that the right answer to his question, that, that, that you're an, an illustration of what could be done? Right? But you don't have uh, 80 years or 90 years or state sanction to make us all confident that you're going to be there in 20 years. That's right. Um, ideally, the government would be, would be taking responsibility for all this. But I'm just not sure how we get there. So if this is sort of a first step. I'm saying, look what could be done. Hopefully, this will whet their appetite or somebody's appetite uh, in, in the legislature to at least provide a budget or someone in the court to ask for a budget. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that will happen. But can I ask how big your budget is? Is that a personal question? But uh, I mean, I, this is a, a wonderful site. Um, if the state of Washington wished to provide that, and assuming they didn't have to inflate your budget tenfold, um, what would it cost them? Uh, well, that would depend on what, how much they wanted to pay a real person to do it. I mean, I, I'm a real person, but I, 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 just, you know, I don't charge anything. I mean, I do this in my spare time. So uh, it would basically be how much it would cost to at least get one full-time person, I'd say. How much do you spend on, on it now? I mean, I understand you're volunteering your time, but what, what's the, the burn rate for a year on this thing? Well, right now it's probably, I mean, it's a part-time project, probably 15, 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. That's about it. And that doesn't include the work of the uh, Foley Institute and the uh, support uh, the human endeavor that they put into this project as well. But it's not, it, it's probably less than the cost of what I suspect the court is paying now for its current website. In terms of manpower and, and, and just dollars. Is this a tens of thousands of dollars per year enterprise or a hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars per year enterprise? Assuming you were to get paid and everyone were to get paid. And is this millions of dollars a year? No, it would be tens of thousands. I mean, maybe, maybe right. 50,000. So half of that PE. Fair to say. Yeah. State your name, please. I'm Michael Roback from the University of Illinois College of Law. Uh, has the National Center for State Courts expressed any interest in helping or being kind of a, I mean, because it seems to me this is it, it's sort of in line with the kinds of things that they're trying to do, uh, at least in terms of data collection and so forth. Well, I'll let Jerry talk about that because we did, we, we presented uh, at the, their last conference, uh, but I don't know what kind of feedback you actually got. No. <laughs> but their clientele is not the public. It's uh, other court administrators, court personnel. So Sorry, that's, I'm a former court administrator. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, and and, and I, I certainly endorse uh, Jeff's characterization. We met with the administrators and several of them, and all they could do was find roadblocks to everything we wanted to do. We met with the justices. They were just gaga at what we were trying to accomplish and delighted to help us. Maybe it's because the court, admi the court administrators are not elected, but uh, judges in the state of Washington are. 
So there's some importance in providing a positive public face for these men and women. And uh, I think we've, we've served that function well, whereas the court's own site really fails in that respect. Yeah, it's related uh, to the point about how the court administrators and personnel perceive endeavors like this. And it seems like it was already mentioned that usually they don't consider uh, the public or anybody else except the working attorneys to be their primary patrons. And it seems like this stuff that says, well, this is fine for you guys, uh, scholars and academics who want to do all this great sort of research and you know, move your career to school. But, you know, that's not, our, that's not why we were there. We're there. We're here for to administer the courts and deal with the attorneys day in day out. We, we don't really have an interest in this. It's not our job, and we don't want it to be our job. Right. Yeah. So that's what I, we think that there's a market for this, but it takes uh, public spirited individuals, academics who see uh, commitment and, and, and institutions, typically universities, law schools, who are here for the long term, who are ready to maintain that. Uh, I'd like to think that there's somebody here in the Seventh Circuit who'd like to do something for the Seventh Circuit website. And Frank Easterbrook is uh, uh, the most aware, technologically aware federal judge uh, I know of, uh, he's certainly one of the top. Uh, and that website could certainly profit from a similar re-engineering or actually uh, uh, generating that data from the Seventh Circuit into something like this. Um, Tim, yeah. state your name. Before we, uh, we overstay our welcome here, I really would like Jeff to uh, talk about his Supreme Court work uh, because uh, I think it's going to be a great uh, benefit to all of us. So, uh, Jeff, why don't you talk a bit about... Uh, all right, well, I just have one slide on this because I wasn't really sure how, how relevant it is. Um, I just kind of threw, put this website together on a whim because, uh, well, for a couple of things. One, one day I was reading an article in the Green Bank, uh, their, uh, their almanac, 2010, I think. I was reading an article by Dahlia Lithwick called Shit Doesn't Happen. It was basically about the FCC profanity case that the Supreme Court heard uh, last year. And uh, just on the very first page of her article, it was like footnote soup at the bottom of it. It was just like, you know, it's eight or nine different footnotes, some, some Really long. I think it wouldn't be great if there was something like a tiny URL or something like that for uh, for legal materials that that uh, would be great for uh, for uh, lawyers and people who follow the court to use. And plus, I also have my own needs right now. I'm I'm working on uh, uh, an iPad application. It's supposed to work on iPhones here, but basically an application that will have all of the uh, published U.S. Supreme Court opinions built into it. And uh, so I needed a repository for that information. It's basically just taking uh, what Carl has on resource, bulk.resource.org, <coughs> along with some other resources. You know, the Supreme Court had its um, sort of comprehensive list of um, case citations. And I, so I, I, and then there's the Supreme Court database itself. So I have these three primary sets of information. I merged them into a set of XML files and put them on this website, which will form the basis for some other projects I'm working on. But I also added the ability to create these, uh, what I call persistent URLs for, for these legal materials. And the idea was that there would be a well-formed URL for, for a given court and a given opinion from that court. 
and then if other if there were other organizations that had their own links to those uh, related to those cases, then there could be um, additions to the URL. You see three examples here: one for Google Scholar, one for OIA, and this kind of um, it, so it makes the the law easier to cite, I would say. And if, you, and if you go to the website, you can actually, and you type in a, site, a U.S. report citation, it'll actually display, okay, so let me bring up the site. <coughs> have some examples on the example page. So if you were to just type in 384 U.S. 436, um, then and in this box here, it'll display uh, a very basic citation for that, including the, the sort of tiny URL link that I generated for that case. And if you had other um, resources uh, or repositories information for that case, um, there's a web mechanism for adding that to the site. I just have Google Scholar and OIA right now. So this would be the, the uh, what you normally see from Google Scholar um, that I generate more compact URL for that, which then just takes you straight to the Google Scholar's rendition of the case. And uh, all of this, uh, all 35,000 uh, Supreme Court opinions uh, will reside on your iPad right? and searchable because they're all in the indexes, all the indices are wrapped up in the, in the app. It's just instantaneous search. And I'll be using some of the metadata uh, from the Supreme Court database so you can do some basic filtering of the cases by constitutional issues, or, uh, uh, eras, different national courts, or uh, opinions written by specific justices, that sort of thing. Coram So um, this is obviously a sophisticated data processing application for the Supreme Court. I, I'm assuming the reporter of the Supreme Court and the librarian are coming out here once a month to work with you, or the administrative <laughs> office of the courts has been asked you to come in for briefings? Uh, yes, on a, on a regular basis in my dreams. Um, no, there's the, 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 the court and the, the individuals in the court generally are arm's length from, uh, from my efforts. I mean, I have cordial relationships with just about all the principals, but their court administrators, in court administrator mode, they're good at saying no. And they're also very good at identifying what the Chief Justice and uh, his principal court administrator, Jeff, uh, Jeff, whose name now escapes me. Uh, yes, Jeff Benier, um, uh, signals, and that is, you can do this, but uh, don't expect any cooperation from us. I think the most resistance I've had was from the clerk of the court. Um, and that's when I, I said, uh, since the, I asked him for copies or access to the, to the electronic versions of the briefs, since the, since the briefs are, are now required to be submitted electronically, uh, I couldn't see any reason why he would say that we couldn't have them because we knew we could do a better job than the ABA in sharing them. And uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't deign to answer my request, even though it was a polite one. But he did send a message to the uh, public information officer who then relayed to me that the clerk would not answer. The answer is no, and that he wouldn't answer my request. So I think the problem there is that, that it, the, the court likes to hunker down. It, it is, it is terribly resistant to change of any sort. The ABA is a safe way to proceed from their perspective, and the fact that the ABA watermarks the, the briefs and encrypts them, well, that doesn't matter because I don't think the clerk understands watermarking and encryption, so it doesn't, doesn't seem to bother him, although it bothers uh, some of us. So we found our own way around that, but it's just a long and tedious process, and we just need better access and a willingness to share. I think in the long term, the court has to concede something to the public, but I think its biggest fear is video in the courtroom. So any step it takes in that direction, either by uh, more by any release of same day audio, or same month audio, uh, is a step closer to. The, the challenge of putting video in court. 
be interested to know what, uh, what Solicitor General Kagan says on that score. She's uh, already spoken on it. Okay, and she said? She's open to the idea. Okay, open to the idea, that's good. That's, that's better than most of them. That's correct, it's better than being close to the idea at the start. So I think it's still a long way. Um, I was there recently and uh, just sat around for a tour of the building and I confirmed with the uh, tour leader who was asking for questions. I said, are there, are there are, I heard that there are um, uh, spittoons behind the bench. And she confirmed that yes, behind the bench there's a spittoon at every spot. I said, when was the last time that anyone spat in a spittoon? <laughs> she couldn't guess, but I would figure it was probably around 1900, 1920 when that was still uh, an accepted public activity but the spittoons are still there. So change comes very slowly. But in the meantime, we can't change. We must change. We, we can't resist change. We accept change and we will uh, we'll figure out how to make this work thanks to, uh, to Carl's energy and vision. Uh, we'll put our shoulder to this big wheel and get it rolling. Any other questions? Nope. Thank you, Carl. Thank you.